Welcome to another episode of China Update, where I provide you guys with the most up-to-date political, economic, and geostrategic analysis on the world's number two economy. My name is Tony. Let's jump in. Okay, happy Wednesday, everybody. First up, as anticipated in yesterday's video, on Tuesday at an emergency session of the NPC National People's Congress, Beijing formally announced the replacement of Foreign Minister Qin Gang with his predecessor Wang Yi. Beijing, of course, has remained very tight-lipped surrounding what exactly is the reason for the replacement. Only a matter of months into the new roles, and in the middle of a charm offensive with European nations and tough exchanges on the diplomatic and other fronts with the United States, regular viewers know the background that led up to all of this. Qin had a meteoric rise from assistant foreign minister in 2017 to his appointment as Chinese ambassador to the United States in 2021. Foreign minister in December of last year, and then as a member of China's cabinet, the State Council in March of this year. We remember that Xi Jinping himself handpicked Qin for the foreign minister role late last year, and as such, there is a risk that this affair could become somewhat of an embarrassment to the general secretary. Quote, "You need to see these situations as opportunities for others to put pressure on Xi Jinping." End quote. However, claims that this affair seriously undermines Xi's legitimacy remain premature and likely exaggerations. Quote, This doesn't mean Xi's power has been shaken; just that he occasionally makes a bad bet. Xi was and will remain the dominant decision maker. Qin's role was to implement Xi's vision. End quote. Qin disappeared from public view on June 25th, as he was preparing to attend a meeting of Southeast Asian nations. This was also the likely reason why Joseph Borrell's EU summit trip to Beijing was. Abruptly postponed without reason. The foreign ministry said at one point that Qin's absence was due to health reasons, but it subsequently refused to give any further details. In the ensuing weeks, speculation regarding what was going on was rife. And now, with the official ousting without explanation, we should expect speculation, especially those of the more salacious variety, to go into overdrive. Quote. One indicator that Qin has discipline rather than health issues is that all mentions of him are being scrubbed from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs website in what looks like a form of digital erasure. If he were a comrade in good standing who had fallen ill, I am not sure that would be happening. End quote. The decision to go with Wang Yi as the new foreign minister is interesting. It tells us a lot about what decision makers are thinking currently. This is a lower position that the top diplomat, or to use his official title, director of the Chinese Communist Party Central Committee Foreign Affairs Commission office, Wang is stepping into. Wang is one of the least disruptive choices to take over. Very much a safe bet, suggesting that perhaps a shaken leadership doesn't want to take the risk with another bad bet, and perhaps too there simply are not qualified people waiting in the wings to step into roles like this. Quote, Beijing seems to have judged that the situation is severe enough at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs that they did not think they could trust anyone who's already there to take the job. We have seen this pattern before with major cases where a Politburo member is brought in to steady the ship and purge the old gene stables. I presume that's what Wang will be tasked to do. End quote. Wang will no doubt be hoping that this labor is not quite as Herculean. One of the issues with concentrating power is that sometimes good, competent, and politically acceptable replacements are not readily available. If the need arises, that a key decision maker needs replacing. In saying that, Wang could also just be acting as a placeholder appointment until a younger official gets the nod for the role. Though we should expect Beijing to thoroughly do its due diligence this time round. Another implication for the return of Wang is that Qin's disappearance will not have any impact on the direction of the PRC's foreign policy, which is guided by Xi Jinping thought on diplomacy. Another implication to note too is that Qin is a strong English speaker and a decades-long student of the American system. Known by some as an America hand, whereas Wang Yi's experience is as a Japan expert, more familiar with East Asian affairs. Thus, the replacement potentially reduces the foreign ministry's ability to interface with U.S. officials at the top levels and understand U.S. diplomatic signals. There is another implication to all this too. 
Wang Yi, a Politburo member, with his role in the Central Committee Foreign Affairs Commission office, is now the most dominant foreign affairs official in the PRC in perhaps decades. This week, Wang is meeting with BRICS leaders, including officials in Brazil, Russia and South Africa. The National People's Congress readout of Chen's replacement only removes him as foreign minister. Chen still officially remains a state councillor. Interestingly too, the document uses the word removed rather than dismissed, the latter more common when an official leaves a post for disciplinary reasons. However, one commentator observed that dismissal usually comes when a party disciplinary investigation is complete, while removal is used when one is underway. Let's close our discussion of Chin's removal with this observation. Quote, We have these occasional moments that remind us just how little we know about Chinese politics. I didn't see a single rumor that Wang Yi would take over. End quote. While we are on elite politics, one more quick development to cover. The same National People's Congress Standing Committee session which removed Qin Gang also installed People's Bank of China Party Secretary Pan Gongsheng as the new governor of the People's Bank of China. Unlike Qin Gang, however, this development was largely anticipated by analysts. His appointment marks the first time since 2018 that the top two positions of the People's Bank of China, governor and communist party secretary, will be held by one person, potentially streamlining decision-making at the top of the country's central bank. Next up, the Chinese economy. Hey everyone, if you enjoyed today's episode of China Update, don't forget to hit that like button. It's also a huge help if you can share this with people who you think might be interested in this sort of thing. It's the best way to help the channel grow. And as always, anyone who can go the extra mile and help keep China Update financially sustainable, Patreon and Buy Me Coffee links are in the description below. Thank you so much, everybody, for the ongoing support. In yesterday's video, we discussed the comments coming from a special Politburo session on Monday. See that video for a deep dive into the content of the meeting. Analysts at Goldman Sachs wrote today that the Politburo was, quote, slightly more dovish than expected, end quote. While analysts were not too impressed with the lack of specifics, the markets on Tuesday, yesterday, appear to be much more positive about the signals. In Asian trading yesterday, Tuesday, Chinese stocks saw their biggest one-day rally since November last year, when it was clear that zero COVID was about to be dropped. Property and technology stocks in particular soared. Mainland China's CSI 300 rose 2.9%, while Hong Kong's Hang Seng Index was up 3.7%. The Hang Seng Mainland Properties Index and the Hang Seng Tech Index both saw more than 13% and 5% lifts respectively. Property giant Country Garden and its management unit Country Garden Services both listed in Hong Kong rebounded 18% and 26.5% respectively. E-commerce platform JD.com and search engine group Baidu both rose more than 7%. The latest rally put the country's real estate sector indexes on track for their first monthly gain after four months of heavy losses. Indeed, we note that many of these jumps across these indexes have been off low bases. The CSI 300 in particular has seen a horrible performance in recent time versus global peers. Tuesday's gains left Chinese equities up only 0.3% year-to-date and down almost 3% in dollar terms, well below the almost 20% rise for the S&P 500. We also note that this rally may have been driven by short sellers closing out their bets against Chinese stocks. Quote, There's a herd instinct here, and about two-thirds of this rally looks like short covering. The Plip Bureau hasn't talked about anything solid yet in policy terms, but if you had a short position before this, you probably needed to cover today because everyone else is. End quote. And of course, not all are impressed yet. Quote, we will reserve judgment until we hear some details. We have had plenty of vague promises already, which don't amount to a great deal so far. End quote. Okay, that is today's episode of China Update. Thank you so much, everybody, for watching. Have a wonderful Wednesday, wherever you are. And I will see you all tomorrow.